Welcome to the recorded version of Aging in an Age-Friendly Home, Managing the Costs of Home Modifications with Home Equity, from April 27, 2017, sponsored by the National Reverse Mortgage Lenders Association. A leading authority on aging in place, Louis Tenenbaum is the founder of Homes Renewed, a coalition of business, government, not-for-profits, and consumer stakeholders. Uniquely straddling the building, aging, healthcare, and policy worlds, Lewis was named a 2016 Influencer in Aging by Next Avenue and won a prestigious Hive, which is Housing Innovative Innovation, Vision, and Economics Award. His recent article, Aging in Place Needs Out-of-the-Box Thinking, appeared in Forbes and received more than 4,000 shares. Todd Brickhouse is a president of Brickhouse Design Group. For more than 35 years, Brickhouse Design Group has pro- provided architectural and design services to private clients, New York State agencies, and insurance companies working with individuals who are physically challenged or aging in place. Craig Barnes is the national training leader at Reverse Mortgage Funding, responsible for training all reverse, reverse mortgage funding associates and their business partners. At this moment in time, I would like to turn the presentation over to Jenny Warwa from the National Reverse Mortgage Lenders Association, who is going to open up here with some opening remarks. Welcome, Jenny. Well, thank you so much, Steve, and thank you to all of our presenters today for being a part of this webinar, which is one of NERMLA's Reverse Mortgage Education Week series, uh, where we're talking to different types of professionals about the way that using home equity can really help older homeowners to supplement retirement savings and support aging in place. And I want to... um, just begin by saying something that we all know, which is that 87% of people age 65 and older would prefer prefer to stay in their own homes and communities as they age. And we call this aging in place, but it actually seems to happen more by a default than as a choice. So we've invited Louis Tannenbaum and an Uh, an authority on this topic to share his perspective on the desires versus the reality of today's aging Americans. Louis? Hi, Jenny, and hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me here. It's a great opportunity to talk with so many people about this, and I've been charged, and it's my pleasure to start out with a little context. Um, The question I have is, why is this conversation about how to finance and update our homes so important? And the answer is that it's basically about longevity. Longer lives is probably the most important achievement of our scientific and technological endeavors as a country and as a culture. And, uh, you know, what can be more important of what we've done than more life? So longevity is really important, and in many respects, it's also a moving target. It continues to advance, and we don't know where the end might be. When I got involved with this stuff about 25 years ago, we talked a lot about the pig and the python. We saw this idea of a large population of boomers was going to be a big bulge in the demography, moving through our institutions and our infrastructures like a veritable pig, moving through a python, and and you can picture that, I think. But also that the boomers were sociologically – changing everything as we move through society, stamping our feet, um, thrusting our elbows out, the me generation, into every corner of society. And we were pretty comfortable with that view, but in fact, lately we stopped talking about the pig and the python because demographers have realized that the millennials will be as large, if not larger, a cohort. And if current trends continue, as we expect them to with Uh, continued uh, scientific breakthroughs, millennials will grow even older than boomers. So it's no longer a pig in the python we're talking about. In fact, an aging society is the new normal. The percentages aren't going to change. And um, what comes up in terms of aging in place is the idea that our homes need to be aligned as just infrastructure of the basic society with the um, current and future reality of American demographics. Our homes were mostly designed, the design characteristics of of our homes emerged quite a while ago, really in the post-war housing boom, and they haven't so much kept up with this idea of increasing longevity. So um, that statistic, that 87% statistic is well-documented, and repeated over many years. And it speaks to the point that people really want to maintain that autonomy 
that goes along with owning their own home. And there's no reason why they shouldn't. There's also pretty good evidence that people um, don't uh, want to uh, move, that they want to stay in their home, in touch with their community, in touch with that autonomy, and in touch with all the factors in that community. Now, we often refer to this as independence, but I don't call it independence because um, I call it interdependence. Interdependence is a reality. Independence is some sort of false ideal, but interdependence is based on friends, family, affinity affiliations, and services relationships in the community, and those relationships in the community start from the base of our home. So um, interdependence is the way it is really throughout our lives. When your children, the bus stop comes to your neighborhood, the trash company comes to everybody's house or the trash truck, uh, water service goes into the homes, electricity, everything about that is an interdependent relationship based in the um, uh, castles that we call our homes. Um, so aging in place may bring more focus to that, to the interdependence, because the ch pace of change in needs and demands increases. Um, so the service component becomes more acute and needs to be more dynamic. But it's very much the nature of our lives at every age is from the base of our homes. We are in, interdependent, relying on and enjoying the fruits of community. So as we enjoy community through the choice and control of our homes, um, ownership rates are actually highest among older citizens. And these facts, ownership rates, 87%, it parallels the results of a Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies report a few years ago, finding that the bulk of long-term care will occur in single-family, owner-occupied homes, but the homes aren't prepared. So though we may think about assisted living or continuing care retirement communities or moving to a 50-plus community or something like that, the bulk of long-term care is going to occur in single-family, owner-occupied homes, but the homes are not prepared. So this session about the types of things we need to do preparing homes is not only or not specifically or not even really about aging and frailty of particular Americans, but about the new normal of a longer lifespan. As we um, see what's on the slide here, I want to mention that Todd and I, who've known each other for 20 plus years, um, and many other colleagues of ours have been talking about this for many years. Our pitch has basically been something akin to this slide here about what seniors fear most, um, demonstrated by the 87% and this survey that losing independence is a greater fear than death. Since people are interested, um, we think people are interested, we have been going around, Todd and I and many others, providing them the information they need to be informed consumers about this. So the appeal um, is that we prepare, is that people are going to preserve their independence and we're going to help them take the bull by the horns or pull themselves up by their bootstraps or something like that. And um, after 20 plus years of Todd and I and others raising awareness and educating people, it's pretty about these values that they've expressed in these and similar studies. The problem is that people really haven't picked up on it. People haven't done this. And this presentation, this webinar, and others are ways to encourage people to understand. Um, but the fact that we've been doing these presentations for years and, and people haven't picked up on it is actually validated now by work um, at the Frameworks Institute, which you can look up online, uh, Frameworks Institute, that shows that people don't hear exactly what we say. So we say preserve your independence. What people really hear is that they didn't prepare well, that they didn't exercise, that they didn't eat well. And so what happens to them um, and bad luck that they have through aging is their fault, and they don't really want to hear about it. They'll accept responsibility, but they don't want to hear about it. So though we as professionals in this field see this as silly because we recognize that changes in health, capabilities, and mobility are just part of the normal aging process, but it's not what people hear. So the question emerges, how do we more effectively communicate about it? What can we say to reach people to get them to act to prepare their homes? And so I have another communication here that I'm going to read before I close off and turn over to Todd. And I hope that um, people listening to the webinar um, will type in their questions and discussion, even at this point, 
for our discussion that we'll have in the last 15 minutes and kind of type in your thoughts and your comments on what I'm about to say and see if that can be part of our discussion later. So um, here I go with the new shtick that I'm trying out just on you today, and I really appreciate this opportunity. It's unfair that this miracle achievement of medical and science resulting in prolonged longevity, in fact, it, it makes it unfair because it renders some people unable to participate because community design and home design hasn't kept pace with the scientific progress bringing us longevity. The fact is, we have rebuilt our homes over time as technology has changed. Many homes people occupy today were built without indoor plumbing. We added indoor plumbing. Many were built without electricity. Think about the Rural Electrification Act in the 30s that brought electricity to many homes that we were occupying before and we still occupy but didn't start with electricity. Later and all through this, we added furnaces and even more recently, we upgraded to more efficient furnaces and have policies in place to help weatherize homes because we wanted to meet the changing cost of fuel. So we updated our housing infrastructure. Now we're going even further, adding solar collectors, and because our country sees the value and importance of reducing our carbon footprint and more efficient use of available fuels, there are policies that encourage solar collectors too. From that history, it's a very easy step to recognize that the result of the science and technology that has given us longevity should bring programs and policies to upgrade our homes for this scientific achievement as well. It's not about aging and frailty. This is about the continuing pattern of American ingenuity that has kept our housing infrastructure aligned with changing science and technology. Housing should be part of the new normal as well. And with that, I really do encourage everyone to uh, speak their minds by typing questions and comments uh, below as Todd, I turn it over to Todd who helps us understand in more detail the type of upgrades I'm talking about. Todd? Yes, hi, thank you everyone for, thanks to everyone for attending. Thank you, Lewis, that was a great piece and, and very informative. Uh, you know, what we do in our homes is is uh, a very tough decision for many of our clients. In our designs and what we do for people for many years now is we really retrofit. And retrofit uh, is a, a word basically used to modify an existing house to make it livable for the condition of the individual who has a disability. So we see many, many of our clients are, are individuals with disabilities and we're trying to provide a way so they can stay in their homes. So on this next slide, I'll just give you a, a, back, a backdrop on this. This gentleman was a fireman, a New York City fireman who had a stroke uh, while he was fighting a fire. And we were asked to come in and figure out how to provide accessibility in his apartment in Manhattan. They have a condo, actually. But this is some of the things that we're, we're up against in the New York area and many other cities. What happens is you have uh, a lot of places that very, are very hard to retrofit and modify. And as Lewis is saying, uh, basically, where we're trying to reno renovate homes and, and make it a, a, a continuity through the, through the whole system and making these places accessible, uh, like they upgraded with electric and plumbing. What the issue is for us in our designs is where do we get the room to do it? In some cases, you know, we can provide a, a, you know, a, a beautiful entryway into the house using a lift. But, you know, if it's in Queens or it's in Brooklyn, in Staten Island, most places, a lot of times the houses are so close together, you're locked out of using a ramp. You have to go to a lift. And a lot of people don't want to use a lift, but this is the only way to get them in their homes. And interior of the houses, a lot of people live in brownstones. They're very narrow, a lot of these homes. And, they're, and, and, and the walls are not just sheetrock like a lot of homes. They're concrete, uh, the older style homes. So the renovations are much more complex and much more expensive. And, and this is, in this situation, this gentleman's bedroom was very small to get him into his bathroom. And we really didn't want to have a swing door going into the bedroom. So we, cu we cut out the, fire, the wall, the, basically the concrete wall, and provided a pocket door to get him into his 
into his bathroom space. And then the next shot shows the shower. That shower we had to use a, uh, you know, a linear drain so the water wouldn't roll out in, into the house, uh, into their bedroom, since the space was smaller than we normally work with when we build roll-in showers. Now, for you who don't know what a roll-in shower is, and I know a lot of you come from a different background, that's a design that allows a person who is in a shower chair, which is like a wheelchair, to be able to roll into the space and have a full area that they can sit in their chair and take a shower and be able to take care of their own personal needs. And this is how we see independence for a lot of our clients, when they can handle their own personal needs or where they can modify a space so they can live there as independently as possible, depending on their capability and their function, we're able to provide them a space that they are allowed to function in and they will have to depend on others, and that's what we're hoping. The sink is set at a height that can, he can wheel under and operate the lever faucet on his sink. Oh, let me get, I'm sorry, let me get to the next shot here. And this is the controls that operates a handheld shower, and this device here is a sliding wand that has a handheld shower on it. So where, from where Lewis is, where he's doing a lot of work in the field of changing thoughts on, uh, on policy so homes could be remedied and modified, uh, we're, and, and I'm sure he does a lot of design work as well, almost all our work is doing designs and working out uh, renovations for individuals, and we provide that, and then we oversee the construction in many cases for different, different companies or people paying for this. In our next shot, this is a very typical renovation where you have what's called a retrofitted um, base and a linear drain, and this is mostly for individuals who are semi-ambulatory. And having a flush transition, like in the other shot with the linear drain, it allows even an individual, whether in their shower chair or ambulating, they can walk in, they can use their walker, and they can do a transfer and sit down in that shower seat and, and have the controls right opposite them, which is no more than about 40, 44 inches away. So they can just reach over and grab the controls and operate their own, own shower and take care of their own personal needs. And, and this is not just something fluff-wise as far as making it nicer or, or a little more functional. Some of our clients, when they come home from the hospital, the transition from their stroke or from their injury, um, they haven't been able to have a shower or be able to mo take care of their own personal needs, sometimes over a year. So they're being bed bathed by attendants or by family members. So this is a very real modification, very real change. And we just, and working with you know, the types of funding, reverse, more, uh, reverse funding, the, that type of funding now is only for us have come into the last about 12 to 15 years where we've started working with that type of uh, funding uh, policies that allow people to renovate their homes even if they have limited personal uh, cash flow. This is the next shot here. So, you know, this shot is not something we did, but we pulled this out because I want to show you, you know, most people think of an accessible shower as, you know, something that's small, it's confined, but this is a roll-in shower. And over here on the left, you can't really see it that well, but it's an open sink and it's designed so you can wheel underneath the vanity. There's towels on your right, which could be an open medicine cabinet design where you can get to the cabinetry and towels. And this is, look at the picture window they have here. So you don't have to make things, a lot of our designs, we try to keep the aesthetics up. We try to make the look of the place just like they would like it, even though they might be in a wheelchair or a semi-ambulatory using a walker. We try to keep their homes looking like their homes so they want to stay there. This is another beautiful prefab shower. This shower is recessed into a wall, a pocket, it's like it was a closet at one time that we put in. And again, a linear drain here, open vanity underneath here. So they get underneath the sink, lighting. So this is a prefab design that you can buy from companies and they install the grab bars, they put in the water walls, they put the whole thing where you just put it together in a matter of several hours and then re-rock around it and dress it up and make it look pretty. Uh, but that's not like a tile shower and that's what we do a lot of, where we actually do a shower, a rolling shower, bathroom that's completely tiled. Now, uh, this is a, these are, you've seen these on TV, these walk-in tubs. Uh, a lot of people like them. 
Um, they have different versions of these. Some are soaking tubs, like this one. It's relatively high. Uh, some have the motor right here on the side, as you can see next to the commode. Uh, other models are designed where the whole wall opens up, the whole side opens up. And when you do that, you need a bigger space. And again, so a tub like this can run three to 5,000, and then you have to have a, a modified bathroom to make it work. And so now you're usually making the bathroom even bigger than it is now. So you have to expand the room into another adjoining bedroom or closet. So it gets costly, these things. And that's why this has to be thought out uh, on, a, on a national level um, where funding is available for people so they can stay in their homes and maintain their independence or maintain their ability to stay in their homes for as long as they, as long as they want. And that's what the reverse mortgage funding is great about. People could take the funding out. Say, so say you have a, enough money from the reverse for, uh, mortgage funding to renovate your bathroom, and that's maybe $25,000 um, in this area. It might be cheaper other parts of the country. And then, you know, but you still haven't modified the way to get the person in the house. So now you still need a ramp outside or a lift outside, and a lift that only goes like three feet, a vertical lift, they're called. It could run you another 15000 installed with concrete and electric. And so... The, you know, the, this, this whole new concept of using your equity in your home to make your life independent is a phenomenal idea. And, you know, I've just really taken the bull by the horns in the last couple of years of getting more involved with this stuff because it's a real change, a way to change people's quality of life. This is a Hevwi, H-E-W-I, Hevwi sink. This is a rounded design sink. It's geared to persons with disabilities. You have hand holes on the both sides that can also hold a towel, good open space on top where you can put your soaps and your hand towels, and it's designed to be wall mounted. Okay. Now, in this shot, there's a young lady here. Now, Headway is also taken on where they are making colors on their sink around the rim, sometimes at the edges over here. So people with visual impairments or people with some, some forms of dementia will be able to see the colors if you remind them where they are, what position they, uh, the sink is in. So this is just another ovoid sink, another design for people to look at and get ideas from. And these could be wall mounted too. So the sinks don't have to be very, you know, a lot of you probably went into bathrooms and saw handicapped sinks that are more like rectangular boxes and they come very far off the wall. But that's usually for commercial application and was very well received during you know, the 90s and early 2000s. But now with designs that are coming out, bigger companies like Toto, American Standard, Kohler, Hevwi, they're all coming out with products that are geared to the senior populations who have a more expendable income and also buy own houses where they've built up equity and could provide nicer renovations when they when they're planned to do the renovations for themselves. All right, another another design, another handicap type sink, but it's not really a handicap sink, it's just a good design. So I'm running a little behind. I want to let Lewis has done a, a, a beautiful design on a kitchen that he worked on, which is uh, really a pretty design. And it's usable and adaptable. That was a terminology from the Americans with Disability Act. So you'll see what I mean by usable and adaptable, where it looks like everybody else's kitchen, and yet it can be changed over so people who might be in a wheelchair can use it much more successfully. Lewis, are you there? Yeah, I am, Todd. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so you see this kitchen, what I'll call it, closed up. And probably the only thing that you see here abnormal is that the oven is at an unusual height. And as we go to the next slide, you see that there's a space under the stove where you can pull, pull your knees up under there and cook it that cooktop. There's um, plugs and switches below to plug things in. There's a cutting board that comes out there to the right so that you can be seated while you're cutting. Why does Thanksgiving need to mean sore feet if you can sit down and do your cutting work? You can pull under the um, sink. Uh, as well to do the dishes or clean your vegetables and so forth. And then that oven, when the oven door opens, the middle rack is at the same height as that pull-out 
um, hot pad so that you can uh, open the oven, move the uh, move something out of the oven, put it on that hot pad, close the oven door, you're in much less danger of um, burning yourself. Uh, over at the refrigerator, you see it's a side-by-side -side model with the water in the door, making it easy to get to both freezer and refrigerator space. And there's a rolling cart there, too. So that rolling cart can be used. Maybe you put that hot thing on and wheel it out to the table or clear the table with that rolling cart rather than grabbing everything and trying to put it on your lap if you're seated while you're working in the kitchen. And you see in this next slide, I just wanted to show a couple things about maneuvering. You know, Todd talked a lot about those good sinks. And you can see on this sink, it's a round sink, but the sink is so far, the edge between the white area of the sink and that black curve, it's so far that it's very difficult if you have trunk or balance control problems to lean over and spit. Um, there's another type of oven there that has side opening doors, which makes it much easier to get to the hot rack in the oven without leaning out over that door. Um, if it's an upper wall oven, and then showing um, a, a clothes washing machine, which they have now by a number of manufacturers, um, that is a washer and dryer. So instead of putting clothes in the washer and then having to pull them out, um, you can uh, uh, pull them out pull them out wet and putting them in the dryer, which is an ergonomic nightmare. You put them in wet, dirty, and they come out dry. You put them in one machine dirty, um, it extracts the water, dries them, and you come in and just take them out dry. So I just wanted to throw those couple items and then um, send it back to you, Todd. Okay, thanks, Lewis. Okay. So, I, so yeah, and, when, and mentioning the refrigerator that Lewis was talking about, the side-by-side, -side, uh, my daughter has an Amata unit that has a middle door, too. So that's what I'm talking about. These manufacturers now produce products. So if you have a lower, if you have a refrigeration, a refrigerator, and you have the freezer at the bottom and a middle drawer, and you're in a wheelchair, you can get up to the side of the refrigerator, pull that freezer out, and everything at the uh, will be at the wheelchair elevation, well, the armrest height about 29 inches, so you can reach in and grab things. Or at the middle door. You can pull that middle drawer open, that middle drawer, as opposed to the two doors, and that middle drawer has a lot of drinks and cold items in there. Um, True Appliance is one of the manufacturers who are making a lot of refrigeration systems, indoor and outdoor, and they happen to have a design that works a lot for people in wheelchairs. Um, so let me go to this, or if you're in a scooter. So this ramp design, we did this out on Long Island at Dix Hills about seven, eight years ago with this ramp. And the homeowner has a beautiful home, two-acre piece of property, and wanted something a little ritzier when we built the ramp. And so he didn't want it out of wood. He wanted it so he didn't, you know, worry about when he shoveled it or damaged the ramp. Um, and so we designed out this ramp out of stone. And, and basically the stone ramp with pavers off the middle, the pavers are lined up in such a way that they're flush when, they're, when you're wheeling on a wheelchair or a scooter. And the design, and we had to add lighting into this, which we did on a later date. Uh, on both sides of the ramp to give it a little more look. Uh, but what happens is the ramp design allows a big open area underneath the canopy uh, there, underneath the eave. So when you get up uh, in front of the front door, you have plenty of room for even two wheelchairs. And, and in this case, the design allowed the person to have a very attractive, natural-looking design for their home. And, and at the same time, didn't say ramp, you know, so they had a nice aesthetic view. And this one, we did something similar. This was in Floral Park. This design was for a child with a disability living in this house. And the family had just modified the front of their house a year earlier and didn't want to touch the front. So they were willing to give up, a, create a doorway off the dining room to the left of that picture. And the only thing we had to do was work it out with the town that the town was uh, uh, allowing us to build next to the property. That car is their neighbor's driveway. So we were right on the driveway side. We got a letter from the homeowner, and that homeowner let us uh, build this ramp right next to his property. That wasn't an issue. And uh, we ran a piece, a path off the main ramp, the main run to the house, and created this walk that led to a ramp on the side of the house to the left. And so that design allowed us to create a, a modified design. But again, now, if you built this ramp for somebody and you spent, a, uh, say, $15,000 building this ramp, and then the kid needed a bathroom like this child needed a bathroom renovated with a rolling shower. 
you know, this is where we have to look at ways to modify the funding. Because these houses were built, this house is probably from the 1930s. And, you know, it wasn't designed like a lot of houses. Even my house is from the 50s. wasn't designed to be accessible. My house is a split, so it's very difficult. If you wanted to make all the floors accessible, you'd have to put an elevator on the outside of the house and then build a walk to it. All right, this is another, this is another concept for a ramp. This ramp is a berm ramp. And this berm ramp, what berming is, is you're building it and using the actual, uh, the actual landscape as part of the design. So instead of building a ramp up and over the property, you're building it into the property. And you're adding dirt and you're adding rock and you're adding shrubs and you're making it like a natural path, like a natural walk going to the front of the house or going to the back of the house. And this design allows it to look like anybody else's house without having to have it called out as a ramp. All right, hey, now we're Todd. trying to find it. Yes, ma'am. This is Jenny. How, um, that was a gorgeous ramp. Could you tell us Thank how you. that um, that household paid for that modification, paid for that design? Uh, this family that we did the job for had had uh, funding through their own resources. They were pretty wealthy people. So in this case, they had uh, the ability to pay for it themselves but many of the other, that job right before that, let me just go back. A, do you mind if I go back a couple of slides? Please go back, yeah. Yeah, this job here, this was paid through two ways. This was paid by the family and uh, partly and by the uh, uh, state. They had funding for this. This funding was able to be acquired to the drawings uh, that we submitted to New York State. This child was on Medicaid but they also had private funding through their own resources. Uh, so they were able to pay part of it through their own money. And then the New York State gave them $25,000 to, to provide the other renovations for the bathroom. So they paid for the ramp and the interior bathroom was paid by the state. Wow. So depending again, what, you know, which, which project you're on, I'm trying to find uh, the, uh, most of these are ramps. I don't know if I have a lip showing in this shot. Maybe towards the end, I think. Okay. Would you like to go? Would you like me to Yeah, go let's those, take a or? look at one of the at, at one of the okay. elevators that you created. Okay. Well, this is one. Now, this is a pneumatic elevator, and this pneumatic elevator. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right. This pneumatic elevator is designed to run on air pressure, and in this one, this is uh, a five by five, so you could take a wheelchair on this. And the installation on this is relatively in, is simple because uh, this, this design just requires air pressure to bring it up and down. Now, uh, this one is, again, this was pro pro mostly paid for through uh, private funding. But let me try to get you. Now, this one. Now, this is a, a picture, and, and the next one is another. This is a vertical lift. This was paid by funding through the uh, state again and through an insurance company, Blue Cross Blue Shield. Uh, was one of the companies we're working with who paid for this. Um, this gentleman was disabled, and he was on long-term care, and he wanted to be able to get in and out of his house. And this unit takes him three stops and will bring him up to the third floor of his house as well as from grade. And this was paid for through the insurance company and through some private funding that they had. And uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield has been very proactive as well as Alley Care and a couple of other companies who are actually paying for this to have these homes renovated with ramps and lifts so they can keep their family member in, in their home as opposed to putting them in institutional care. Um, the next one, too. Yeah, this one, too. This was paid through uh, private insurance as well. Um, th these are designs that allow people to be able to remain independent, and it's also allowing the insurance companies to basically uh, stay in their homes and not have to be institutionalized because institutionalization could cost about $120,000 a year, and this renovation probably ran more than, you know, $50,000. Uh, so, so depending on what you're doing and how you approach it with the insurance companies, more and more of them are, are getting on the bandwagon because they see it saves money, and it allows them to be able to keep person home who want to stay home and also allows them in such a way they will not have to have all these health issues, uh, which are inflamed because they can't have access to a bathroom or to their bedrooms. The the work that you you've shown us today is truly incredible, and I believe 
uh, is exactly what we're all talking about, which is helping for people to uh, still take part in their communities regardless of their uh, physical abilities at the time. So I want to thank you so much for sure. uh, sharing everything with us today. I Do you want to mention Designs for Living and talk about that for a sec? Yeah, that's a quarterly magazine that we've been putting out uh, in August. It'll be our fourth year. Um, and what we've been doing is putting out an, an architectural design magazine geared to senior and disabled populations. So we try to educate people uh, about what is out there so they can learn on their own about it and learn more about what's being done for everybody. And uh, it's available for free. And we have sponsors who pay, for, uh, pay ads in it. But you can see it for free on BrickHouseDesigns.net anytime. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm uh, glad that we had an opportunity to see all your designs and and hear from you, and we also talked a, a, a bit about the different ways that people were able to pay for these designs and uh, modifications that you worked on. And one of the ways that uh, you said you were getting more engaged in Todd is talking about uh, using home equity, to, uh, which is converting the value of your house into cash proceeds uh, that can be used for many things. And in the case of older homeowners, those who are 62 and over, there's an opportunity to use a reverse mortgage. And more than a million senior homeowners have used a reverse mortgage to supplement their savings, to age in place. Um, and one of the great things about reverse mortgages is that the funds are not restricted. You can use those loans loan proceeds to support in-home care or to support the types of modifications that we've been talking about today. So to elaborate and explain all of this, we've invited Craig Barnes, who's actually a, um, a trainer in our industry, uh, to talk a little bit more about reverse mortgages. So Craig? Thank you, Jenny. Um, welcome, everybody. And I just wanted to add a few things that we've heard already. Uh, Earlier on, Lewis mentioned 87% of people want to age in place, and I think this is a product, that reverse mortgages are a product that really suits that need. Uh, I often tell the story years ago, we had a borrower who fits that 80, 87% number, and she told us that she wanted to be taken out of her house vertical or horizontal, not vertical. And that mm -hmm. really is very much the... the uh, the borrower who is a great fit for reverse mortgages, those who are 62 and older and a citizen or legal resident, uh, all of our borrowers have to be on the deed. So we do. there are some exceptions for life estates, things like trusts and things like that. But most of the time, if we have, say, a, a couple, they both do need to be 62 or older. Um, we lend on all single families, two to four units, as long as if, if it is a multifamily, there's one that is the borrower's primary. We also lend on manufactured homes, condos, PUDs. Uh, those are all eligible properties. So, again, most, most types of homes we will lend on. We don't do investment properties, vacation homes, co-ops, beds and breakfasts, and those types, of, uh, uh, those types of properties simply because the property that we lend has to be, it has to be owner-occupied and it has to be, a, their borrower's primary residence. Uh, mentioned also new construction without a certificate of occupancy. Uh, and it, that just really lends itself to just a quick conversation about Heckam for purchase. Um, and purchases, um, <clears throat> excuse me, purchases, uh, you can buy a home with a reverse mortgage as well, not just uh, renovate your home, or I'm sorry, not just the uh, not just do it on a property that you already live in. So we've talked a lot today about the modifications and how we're going to pay for those. We're going to talk about some payment options in a minute. But if that house is simply not what the borrower wants, we can also use reverse mortgage funds to also purchase a new home as well. Oh, sorry about that. Let me... So now let's talk a little bit about the payment options that are available. We, we've spoken a lot. We've seen a lot of pictures about the modifications both inside and outside that can be done to a potential borrower's home, but how do they get those monies to pay for it? We, 
Todd talked a lot about private funds and things like that in addition to Medicare, Medicaid, or private insurance, but very often there's there's a gap between what those other sources are paying and uh, and the total bill. So with a reverse mortgage, you can get a amount up front, and that means you can take a certain amount of your funds, not all of them usually, but you can take a certain amount uh, out front to directly pay, say, a contractor or someone who's doing that work. You can establish a line of credit, which you can use as those modifications are needed throughout the course of maybe a borrower's lifetime. Maybe they don't need any modifications today, but as they do age in place, maybe more uh, modifications would be necessary, and they can draw from their line of credit at any time for any reason. They can also set up tenure or term payments. Simply, the only difference is the tenure payment is a lifetime payment, so you'll get a certain amount of money that's established when you close the loan uh, for the life of the loan. And a term is simply uh, for a fixed period of time. So maybe as the work is being done, as your modifications are being done, maybe there's payments that are being made for a certain period of time. Maybe you'd like to set up a term payment so that on the first business day of the month, X amount of dollars go into your checking account, and then you could possibly pay your designers, your contractors, or whoever. And then another popular option with all of our loans is called a modified tenure or modified term. In my opinion, it simply simply kind of combines the best of both worlds. It gives a line of credit available when you need it, but it also gives you an amount of money in a tenure or term payment every month. So you know X amount of dollars will be coming into your checking account every month, but there's also a little safety net there uh, in the form of a line of credit as well. So you might be wondering, you might have heard about reverse mortgages or the costs of reverse mortgages or scams related to reverse mortgages or whatever, but we do a lot as an industry. We do a lot through um, HUD, which insures our loans, uh, but there, there's a lot that we do. First of all, HECMs are non-recourse, and just very briefly what that means is that a non-recourse loan means that the home is the only source of repayment. So the our clients or their heirs, their children often, don't have to worry about what happens if this loan is worth more, uh, sorry, the balance of the loan is worth more than the home is worth. Then that is not a worry because, again, it is a non-recourse loan. HUD mandates counseling for all of our borrowers, so every single borrower who gets a reverse mortgage does need to be counseled by an independent third party approved by HUD. Uh, there are no prepayment penalties, so if maybe they are your client inherits money or wins the lottery, they can always make a prepayment in any amount or in full at any time without penalty. Uh, we have lots of disclosures. If you've gotten a mortgage lately, you know how many disclosures there are in a, in a what we call a forward mortgage. Well, it is exactly the same as a reverse mortgage. There are documents that you get throughout the process. Um, and, that, and there's also redisclosures if things change, change as well. Uh, we also have many different products. If you're familiar with reverse mortgages from five or ten years ago, we pretty much were a one-trick pony. We, but now we have fixed rates. We have interest rate caps, origination fee caps. We have protection for non-borrowing spouses, which I'm going to elaborate on in just a minute. Um, and then finally, the, uh, we, we analyze the capacity and willingness to ensure sustainability. What does that mean? That means that we do now, and we have since 2015, we do look at a borrower's income and we do look at their liabilities because what we want to do is we want to make sure that after the loan closes, the borrower can still pay things like their taxes, their insurance, maintain the home, and still be able to put food on the table and you know, and meet the expenses of daily life. So there is an analysis of capacity and willingness. We call it financial assessment in our world. So there is some, um, some options there. HUD wants to make sure, so, do, so does the National 
uh, Reverse Mortgage Lenders Association, we all want to make sure that once the loan closes, it's a sustainable solution for the borrower. So we talked a lot of today about making sure that the borrowers can age in place with the modifications, but we want to make sure when we advance those funds, when we get that reverse mortgage, uh, the borrower can continue to live there, but also p continue to maintain their lifestyle after loan closing. So next we're just going to quickly talk about those non-borrowing spouses, and this was a change back in 2014. And basically, HUD wanted to make sure that we talked earlier about the 62-year-old borrowers. Well, what if the borrower, and let's just use a husband who's 65 and a wife who's 60 right now, If does that mean they can't get a HECM? Well, it doesn't mean that. It means that, the, yes, we can still get the HECM, and now we have protections for that 60-year-old. So that is really, really important. They have to be married. Um, they have to be married through the duration of the loan, and when the 65-year-old, uh, in this case, were to pass away, that non-barring spouse still has the option of living in that home for the rest of their life. So that's import an important thing that you may have heard over the years about that as an issue with reverse mortgages, but that changed in 2014 when HUD put the provisions in place of non-borrowing spouses. So, Jenny, I think that's all I have, so I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Craig. That was a, a great explanation of uh, reverse mortgages and home equity conversion mortgages, FHA's uh, uh, insured reverse mortgages. And for people who have more questions about this product, I, I encourage you to visit NERMLA's consumer education website, reversemortgage.org. We have a lot of resources there, uh, including a roadmap that explains the entire process of uh, getting a reverse mortgage from start to finish. And we also have some new uh, consumer guides that um, will also help people who have uh, questions who are thinking about getting a reverse mortgage. So thanks very, very much for, for that. Um, Steve, did you want to start taking questions? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much, Jenny. And uh, thanks a lot to Lewis and Todd and Craig for a great presentation so far. Everybody, it is time for the Q&A session uh, portion of this webinar. Ready? So if, if you, uh, you want to have any questions for our presenters, just shoot them in right now. And uh, let's jump right into the pool here, uh, presenters. The first question here for you, um, what's, what is the number one upgrade people should be considering to help people age in place and what is the average cost to implement that? Uh, Lewis, do you want to take that? Or do you want me? Uh, I can. On the bathroom, Go for it, Todd. In the bathrooms, depending on what you do in them, they're averaging about uh, seventeen to twenty-five thousand for the renovation of a bathroom. And this isn't in a New York area. Could be five thousand dollars cheaper out of the out of the city and in smaller communities in different parts of the country. Most important area is the bathroom, I mean, and, uh, and then the entry into the house as well. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, next question. Are you working with occupational therapists to address disabilities and determine the best adaptations for the home environment? Go ahead, Lewis. I'll let you... Uh... Uh, well, there are a lot of occupational therapists who are, are much like contractors in the way they try to and work out thinking through problems. And uh, I have worked in situations, and I'm sure Todd has as well, where an occupational therapist is helping um, so that there's kind of a meeting in the middle of the mind, expertise, interest, capability, knowledge background. Um, I think in some cases, and I think Todd will probably bear me out, um, the, the, where we can go, you know, Todd talked about the limited amount of space, the limited kind of amount of uh, finishes in our toolbox, not finishes, I mean, there's lots of different kinds of tile and there's uh, beautiful colored grab bars and stainless grab bars and, and uh, chrome grab bars, but there's only so many things in many cases that we can do and the space may be limited. So our goal is to do the best we can with what's available. Um, I have, though, and I'm sure Todd has too, worked with really sharp um, occupational therapists, particularly who help us see the range of capability and meet that in a client 
um, with particular problems. And that's that's and that's very helpful too with the clientele because we have OTs. A lot of times the family we're working with already has an occupational therapist from the transition from the hospital, and they can meet us at the job site and give us suggestions based on the person's range of motion. You can have five five persons with multiple sclerosis, and their capabilities could be completely different than each other. So you want somebody there who's knowledgeable if the person isn't on what they can do and they can't do as far as picking out certain kinds of fixtures and the distance you have to have the reach. So that they're very helpful. And OTs and, and PTs can build the insurance company privately so that you don't have to pay them. All right. Um, this next question is for you, Lewis. Uh, how do you pitch older adults to plan in advance, not just after a change in status or an accident, for example? Well, that's that's a $64,000 question. Um, I think it's very hard. Some people have what we call a wake-up call. They've had experience with a friend or relative or neighbor or parent, and they see this, they get an idea on it, and they reach out and find um, someone like Todd or I who has real capabilities on this. Um, I, I hear and see sort of anecdotally more and more people taking this on as articles appear in the newspapers and so forth. But the bulk of my work and Todd's, I think, both um, are on people who really have the onset of adult onset uh, uh, accidents or, for example, MS, uh, Parkinson's neurological conditions. I, that's really a great interest of mine is how we can really make the move and encourage people to uh, do these things in advance. And, uh, you know, I kind of look at analogies and, um, uh, you know, when I spoke about policy, for example, we had a lot of people put solar collectors on once we got into some tax policy that encouraged that. And I, I think that's a way that we need, may need to go as a country. All right. Um, next question. What is the experience with resale value for homes that have modifications for access and aging in place? Because many are in denial about the needs they'll face as they age unless a renovated home is as lovely as what you're showing here. Um, will people sometimes have trouble selling? Can you talk about uh, resale values and how uh, modifications might or might not affect that? Well, I mean, in my experience, this is Todd. In my experience, um, most people have had not had an issue. I mean, if it's a condo and you have obligations to return it, under the Fair Housing Act, you have to basically, uh, the building owners, the landlords, can ask you to return the design back to the original look. But many, many realtors now are really hopped up on this, where realtors are having a way to sell a property or a condo the way it is. So if you ha you know if you're if you're coming down with a disability or you have one that's getting worse and you're looking for a new home or a new place to live, if there's some place that you like that's already modified for you and aesthetically pleasing, then you don't have to do all the work to make it uh, you know fit your needs. It's already there. So in some cases, you know if you have to make a rolling shower and, and put it in as a tub, then you take the, the you basically you do some renovations and maybe it's going to run you. Five thousand dollars to renovate the space to put back a tub and do some renovations, but it's not that big a deal. I mean, most of the people we've renovated homes for over the years have not had issues reselling it, or if they had to restage it to look more like a typical home, then you know they have to lay out some money and uh, and do it. But not not many times that I've experienced that, well, and even with the condos. We're under the Fair Housing Act where you're supposed to return the space back to the original look. Most landlords have sold the properties as is and not renovated. I mean, you're spending, you know, $25,000 on a bathroom in a condominium to make it look aesthetically pleasing as well as functional. And it's silly to have to put it back the way it was when it's usually half the size, you know. So uh, we've had a very good experience with that. I think another answer to the question is that, you know, the data has not been collected about how these homes turn on the market. But my experience, and I've done a lot of shopping with a lot of people, is that these are the homes people are looking for. And I think that's going to be increasingly so. Uh, so that to the degree that, as Todd has shown, it's done in an aesthetically pleasing way, it shouldn't have any uh, detrimental effect on the market. 
Um, there was a parade of homes that occurred with one accessible home up in Minnesota a few years ago. And uh, kind of a little different than most model and demonstration homes, they didn't call any attention to the accessibility features. But they did do exit surveys of people who walked through the home. And for the most part, nobody noticed the accessibility features of a beautifully designed home for a, a fellow who was, I think, a paraplegic. Um, and what they ended up doing is a lot of people walked through the home and then wanted all those features, but they hadn't seen them before they were called out. Right. Right. And I, yeah, Lewis. There wasn't. There hasn't been any long-term surveys of that, you know, because it's really even though we're both doing it for years. There's really been, uh, you know, it's always been onesies and twosies and this and that. Now it's starting to become a regular thing where we have families who are selling their homes, moving into condos, and those condos are asking us to renovate them to make them accessible before they become disabled or before they have issues that will uh, affect their long-term health. So we're, we're renovating homes for people in their early 60s at new condo communities they move into and modifying with the money that they have, the proceeds from their existing home, and so when they could live there into their 80s and 90s. It's interesting. It's a very interesting area to be in. All right. Um, next question. Presenters, will Medicaid and or Medicare assist in paying for any of the home modifications to keep the person in the home? And if so, what specifically will they pay for? Um, well, I, we have done a lot of work. Yeah, Lewis, Lewis, have you done work with Medicaid? No, none at all. Yeah, we've done a tremendous amount. And uh, it's not the same Medicaid that you might have when you get older and, you know, are, are looking to renovate. There's a tremendous amount of um, funding available for children with disabilities. And I'd say 70% of our work is uh, with children with disabilities. And Medicaid funding allows them to renovate their home and some funding is a one-time cap of 20000 and then there's other funding through different Medicaid pro processes that are twenty-five to 30000 per year. And um, not every state has this. It depends on how they've used their Medicaid. And as late, you've heard all the different discussions on Medicaid. But in, our, in, New, York, in the New York area, um, it's allowing children to live in their homes. I've done work on, with children who are on ventilators and are in hospital beds. And we've been able to provide accessibility to their bathrooms or renovated, putting ramps outside. So depending on their situation, uh, there is funding to help keep their homes accessible so they don't have to be institutionalized in some uh, capacity. So this, this, depending on the state and how they use their Medicaid funding, Medicare won't pay for anything. Medicare won't pay for any renovations, never have. And I've been doing this since 1982. Right. Uh, got time to squeeze one last question here. Presenters, can partners with a civil union or domestic partnership qualify as a non-borrowing spouse? Greg, I guess. Craig? Craig, do we still have you on the line there? We can't hear you. Okay, um, squeeze one last quick one in here. Uh, give us a ballpark estimate for a cost of retrofitting an average home to meet an average aging couple's needs. How much money do they get? Oh, I think. <laughs> right. That's, that's that, Yeah, there's two sides. You know, and when I was just in the regular contracting business, people used to ask, um, you know, not only uh, what does it cost, it really varies both on the structural issues we have to deal with, the existing conditions of the home, are the pipes upgraded already, do they have to be upgraded, what are the spaces, how much structural work we can do, is it a large home, are spaces already pretty big, is it a small home, um, and what are the quality of the finishes. But a, a better way to phrase that is, you know, some people have a Toyota and some people have a Mercedes and they can both be red. But you're asking us how much did somebody pay per pound for their Mercedes? You know, it, it's really different. Or for their car, whether it's a Toyota or a Mercedes, um, it varies so much on what we actually do, 
what the finishes the people um, choose right, the and uh, things like that. The finishes alone can add tremendous cost. So if you like glass tiles as opposed to a ceramic tile, you know, a, a glass tile for a small shower could run $3,000 just for the tile plus installation. Whereas you just use regular ceramic tiles, it could run maybe $800. So it depends on, you know, the materials have a lot to do with it. The end, the end result is the same, you're, you, except the, the look is a little different. But the end result keeps it the same. A roll, a roll and shower is a roll and shower. All right. Well, presenters, we have just about reached the end of our hour here, and we're just about out of time. But Louis Tenenbaum, Todd Brickhouse, Craig Barnes, and Jenny Werwa, I want to thank you for a great presentation and for being here with us today. Thanks so much. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you. Thank you.